All right, so I'd like to welcome our first two speakers today, Janet Chen and Kathy Harder. Janet and Kathy are Master Gardener volunteers in Schenectady County, where they both have been uh, very actively involved in a pollinator garden program for public spaces. They help to provide education to the, uh, to the public about the benefits of incorporating native and pollinator plants in our landscape. They have helped to grow and maintain for our gardens and programs here at the Sustainable Living Center. And Janet and Kathy together have taken a seed collecting course with the Albany Pine Bush Preserve and have helped to collect and preserve seeds at the Pine Bush. So thank you all for being here today and I am going to turn the floor over to Kathy and Janet. I we're just going to say hi and start our program right away so we can separate and uh, take off our masks while we're speaking. So thank you for joining us today. Okay, so I'm going to share a screen. Yeah, oh, minimize that, right, okay. Good, I'm just check that everybody. Okay, uh, is, is the screen, um, can everyone see the screen with the beginning slide? I can see it, you're looking good so far. Okay, <laughs> thanks David. <laughs> Our presentation topic today is native perennial seed saving sustaining biological diversity in our home gardens. What does that mean and how can we achieve it? Simply put, it means creating a variety of plant species in our home gardens that will then benefit a variety of animal life, especially insects and pollinators. Our introductory slide shows several seed types, zinnia, baptisia, prairie smoke, and columbine. Note the different physical characteristics of these seeds, their size, shape, texture, presence of a seed coat, etc. They show the diversity of seeds you might find in any garden, and we will show you today how to collect and germinate seeds of various kinds. Oh. Okay. We'll get better at this. <laughs> um, first, I'll review some definitions of plant types. And we'll talk about a native plant definition, which um, we're all familiar with. But just as a review, a native plant occurs naturally in a given location or region. And they're plants that were found growing in North America prior to European settlement. Plants can be native to a continent, a state, or a region. But plants native to one region may not be native in another. Something native to California, for example, might be considered invasive in New York State. Um, and why native plants? Native plants have formed a symbiotic relationship with native insects over thousands of years. Flowering plants adapted to their pollinators and the pollinators adapted to the plants. Um, for example, bees like symmetry in flowers. They like the colors blue and yellow and they're expert at manipulating flower parts. So plants being pollinated by bees experience a constant positive reinforcement for their bilateral, bilateral symmetry and colors. In turn, the flowers exert pressure on the bees. They favor hairiness, body shape, and behaviors that effectively transfer, transfer pollen. Here we see a bumblebee gathering pollen and nectar from the flower of Baptisia. They grip the lower part of the flower with their legs and propel themselves forward to drink the nectar Meanwhile, the fuzzy part of their abdomen brushes the pollen-covered anthers. It's almost as if they were made for each other, and in essence, they co-evolved for that perfect union. Studies have even shown that within minutes of sensing vibrations from pollinators' wings, a plant will temporarily increase the concentration of sugar in the flower's nectar. So the whole concept of the communication that happens between the plants and the insects is really fascinating. A native bar, is a term that refers to the cultivar of a native plant. Sometimes it's a natural variant found in the wild, for example, Annabelle hydrangea, but often it's been developed by a plant breeder 
and would never be found in nature, like this Echinacea cultivar. The double flower is too dense for the bee to even attempt to get in there to get any nectar. So it's really kind of useless for the purposes of um, our insects. In addition, they may not come back true to type. They frequently don't produce seed. They may provide inferior nectar for pollinators, and they provide no genetic diversity because they're clones. On the other hand, there's a few cultivars that do perform better than their native parent. The Mount Cuba Center in Delaware does research in their trial gardens to evaluate native plants and their related cultivars for horticultural and ecological value and to highlight the ecosystem services native plants provide. You can read reports of the trials of the cultivars at their website, which is www.mountcubacenter.org. Invasive alien species are plants that were introduced accidentally or intentionally outside of their natural geographic range and become problematic. So here we see three big offenders, the barberry on the upper left, purple loosestrife below it, and the Norway maple. So if you see something interesting and you don't know what it is, collecting seeds, I recommend using a plant ID app. iNaturalist is a plant identification application developed by National Geographic. It's free and it's pretty accurate in identifying any plant you may not know and allows for feedback from other uses on, users on what you might find. It's available for either Apple or Android products, and that's iNaturalist. Pollination is a very important part of the life cycle of a flowering plant. If you look at the illustration, you can see within the flowers all the specialized parts needed for reproduction. To put it simply, they're male and female components that are needed to reproduce. The tiny pollen grains on the anthers of flowers are the male components, and need to be transferred to the female parts that are found in the ovules of a flower, which is accomplished by pollination. After being fertilized, the ovules will develop into seeds. In a natural plant population, seed production varies from year to year in response to weather, insects, diseases, and internal cycles within the plants themselves. Why are we saving seed? There's so many reasons. First of all, it's a great money saver. Seeds are free. You can collect them yourself. Saving seed yields predictable results. You can see the plant growing and know the seeds from that plant will produce the same plant form and flower that you were seeing. You can exchange favorite native flower seeds with family, friends, and neighbors, increasing the available pollinator-friendly plants in different gardens. You can also increase the colony in your own garden by spreading seed or by starting seedlings yourself to transplant later. If you know the source of your seed, you know that whether there are any contaminants such as pesticides, insecticides, or fertilizers, whereas you may not have this information from purchased seeds. By saving seed instead of buying plants, you minimize the risk of introducing soil-borne diseases that may be present. Because you will select the best, most vigorous plants to collect from, you will have confidence in knowing these plants will do well in your garden because they are from the most viable plants. Native plants thrive on little care. They have no special soil requirements, can survive drought after getting established, and need no fertilization. It's fun to start plants from seed and a great distraction from the winter doldrums, especially now during the pandemic. Let's start by discussing how to collect seed. First, you should note the location of the desired plants while they are flowering because the appearance of the plant will change as it develops from flower stage to seed stage. It usually takes several weeks to go from flower to seed stage, but timing will vary from flower to flower and will also depend on weather conditions. Seed collectors should follow a few polite rules. If collecting seeds from private property, be sure to get permission from the landowner. Never collect seeds on public land and never collect seed from rare or endangered species. Gather only 10 to 25% of the available seed in order to guarantee the plants will be able to reseed themselves and maintain their existing colony. Collect fewer seeds from more plants rather than more seeds from fewer plants for greater biodiversity. 
The seed head of the zinnia in the picture is well past its prime. The seeds are wet and may have started to decay. Also, do not collect seeds that have dropped on the ground. They may have started to decay or become infested with insects. When mature, seeds or the seed head will be dark, firm, and dry, and the seeds will come away from the plant easily. You may need to check seed heads over a period of several days to make sure they have reached complete maturity and are dry enough to gather. Immature seeds will not produce viable, healthy seedlings and may even fail to germinate. <clears throat> there are many methods you can use to gather your seeds depending on the plant and the seed type. Hand gathering, which is simply using the seeds from the plant by hand, is probably the most common and the easiest. You can also clip the seed heads with scissors or a pruning tool and separate the seeds from the stem later. For grasses like the ones shown in the picture, it may be easiest to comb the seeds from the stem into a bag. Be aware of plants that dehiss. When a plant dehisses, the plant's seed pods open and expel seeds when ripe, sometimes scattering them fairly far. In order to collect these seeds, track their maturity and invert a paper sack over the seed head when nearly ripe, tying with a string so the seeds fall into the bag. The picture shows a nylon bag that is available online and has the advantage of your being able to see the development of the plant from flower to seed. However, you can also use paper bags. Because you won't remember later what you have collected, especially if you're collecting from more than one plant on any given day, label, label, label with the plant variety, date of collection, and the source. The next step is to preserve the seeds until you're ready to plant them. This picture shows a variety of seeds drying on my dining room table. One of the best methods for drying seeds is to spread them on several layers of newspaper for a few days. When they are completely dry, a mature, mature seed case can be split open and you can easily separate seeds from the seed head or branch. The next step is to clean the seeds. You may have to open hard seed cases by hand or by threshing, which is rubbing against a coarse screen or sieve, crushing with your hand, or if the seed case is very hard, in the case of the Penstemon seed case, using a wooden block or a rolling pin. You might use a sieve to separate the seed from extraneous fibers, which may be infected with insect eggs, mold spores, or other disease vectors. The next step is to store your seeds safely. Some of the best containers as pictured here are metal containers, paper bags, and paper envelopes. Plastic bags are not recommended unless you can be sure the seeds are completely dry in order to avoid the growth of mold. Temperature and humidity in your storage area are very important. The temperature should be at 50 degrees or below and the humidity level at 50% or below. Store your seeds in the refrigerator, not the freezer, unless following specific stratification directions, which Janet will cover shortly. Although some seeds may be viable after many years of storage, ideally seeds should be planted within one year of collection. And again, label, label, label. Now that you've collected and stored your seeds, you need to know how to put them to use. Many native seed species have an embryonic dormancy phase and generally will not sprout until this dormancy is broken. Stratification is the term we use. It's the process of treating seeds to simulate natural conditions that the seeds must experience in the soil over the winter to break dormancy and initiate the germination process. The seed is the first stage in the life cycle of a plant. Protected inside the tough seed coat is the embryo or the baby plant. Packed around that embryo is all the food that's needed for that plant. During germination, the seed absorbs water and the embryo starts to use its own food store. As you can see in the illustration, a young root begins to grow downward, then the young shoot grows upward and develops into a stem that produces leaves. The first leaves we see are the seed leaves and they help feed the plant's early growth by enhancing photosynthesis. Then the plant continues to grow and it forms its first true leaves. As you can see in the picture with the kale, 
um, the true leaves have the appearance and function that all the future leaves will have and will almost likely look very different than the seed leaves. When transplanting, it's always best to wait for the appearance of the true leaves. A great example of dormancy is the super bloom that occurs in the desert of California, generally about once a decade. Special conditions have to happen. They need prolonged drought, followed by a period of heavy rains, temperatures that are not too hot or too cold, and an absence of strong wind causes an explosion of long dormant seeds, some of which haven't bloomed in years. 2019 was more widespread and the blooms were so intense in color, they could actually be seen from space via satellite imagery. Germination requirements vary by plant type. While most seeds need damp, warm conditions in order to sprout, different seeds have different needs. So there's plant germination codes that have been developed in order to simulate the proper conditions for each species of plant. The codes may seem to vary slightly based on where you purchase the seeds, but the basic methods remain the same. There's two sources for germination codes that I like to use. The Wild Seed Project, which is pictured, is a 501c3 whose mission is to inspire people to take action increasing the presence of native plants grown from seed. They're based in Maine, but many of the seeds and information provided are relevant to our area. The other source is the Prairie Moon Catalog and website. They provide a source for germination information, seeds, plants, tools, etc. Their range is much wider. They provide seeds and plants for our, all over the United States. But if you find a plant you like, the website does offer a map showing the native range for the plant. The germination codes of Prairie Moon differ in that they're a little more specific in terms of how much time is required for each stage, but both are excellent resources. So I'm not gonna go over every single germination code here, but you'll see it starts with A, the easiest to sow, and that indicates there's very few requirements. They don't need a winter cold period to germinate. And so you can sow them outdoors in fall or early spring. Um, and as we move down the list, you see things get a little more complicated. Um, some seeds actually need a cold period, followed by a warm period, followed by a cold period, followed by a warm period. Some seeds have a pulpy substance around the seed itself, and that is a, um, a chemical inhibitor that inhibits germination, so they might need to be cleaned. Um, so as I said, different seeds have different needs. Um, and it's important to note that simply storing your seeds in the refrigerator does not count towards stratification time. Um, special conditions are needed for stratification. Seeds, oh, sorry. So the conditions are important to know, but unless you have a greenhouse or other dedicated area, it may be difficult to meet the conditions that are needed for the seeds you're, you know, you've chosen to propagate. So winter sowing is an excellent way to start your seeds when you don't have the room or equipment to do it indoors. By winter sowing, not only do your seeds self-stratify, they also don't need to be hardened off before transplanting. There's no set schedule to worry about. You can winter sow at your own convenience. The only rule to follow is to wait until freezing temperatures are here to stay, which is right about now. So there's three methods that I'll review today. The first method would be to sow your native seeds directly in the garden in the fall or winter to allow for natural stratification to occur. You wanna make sure you have a diagram so you remember where you sowed your seeds so that in the spring you'll know it's growing. The benefits are that nature will take care of the stratification itself, so there's no need to create artificial conditions and no need to transplant. But the cons to that are that some seeds may be lost to birds or rodents. Without documentation, you may not remember what you've planted. If you're sowing directly in the garden, once spring comes, it may be hard to differentiate young weeds from what you've sown. If you want a little greater control over the process, we can use the second method of sowing into flats or pots. You'll need seeds, clean pots or plug trays, germination mix, labels, a pencil or fade proof Sharpie, a watering can, and a rodent proof screen to place above and below the flats. You'll fill each pot about a quarter of an inch or so from the top, label it with the name and the date, sow seeds thickly but evenly, at least a third to a quarter of an inch apart. 
Some seeds need light to germinate, while some do better placed deeper within the soil. Pay attention to the depth needed as indicated on the seed packet or the germination code. Cover the seeds lightly with sand to the depth of the thickness of the seed and water. And the sand will just help prevent the seed from being splashed out of the pot. Place outside in a level location with screening above and below to deter birds and rodents. And then you can forget them until early spring, like late March or so. When pots become crowded, divide into clumps of three to seven seedlings and repot. When plants reach a mature size, you can plant them in the garden. The third method of winter stratifying is the gallon jug method, although almost any kind of transparent container will do. It's like creating your own little mini greenhouse. The container should be deep enough to hold three to four inches of soil in the bottom and tall enough to allow a few inches of headspace for the seedlings to grow. For the gallon jug method, cut the jug almost in half, leaving the area around the handle attached to add as a hinge. Poke holes in the bottom with a drill or a knife for drainage and in the top for ventilation. Add the soil, wet it down a bit before planting the seeds. Again, plant thickly, but leave a little space between them to make it easier to transplant the seedlings. Note the depth needed as indicated on the seed packet. Label with a paint pen or write on a piece of duct tape or use a plastic plant marker with the container so you don't forget what you planted. Put the lids on. If you're using a gallon jug, duct tape the area you've cut and leave the cap off. And using, if you're using a container with a lid that snaps on, make sure you have ventilation holes in the lid. Move them outside in an area protected from strong winds, but where they get moisture and rain and some sun. You can pretty much leave them be. Um, in this zone, germination probably won't start until late March, depending on the weather. And then you'll start checking for signs of sprouting. The hardier seeds will probably germinate first. Just make sure your seedlings don't overheat and the soil doesn't dry out. You can vent them by removing the tops or making holes in the tops larger. Once the seedlings reach the top of the container, it's definitely time to take off the tops. They're ready to transplant once they get their first set of true leaves. Um, there are some reasons why seeds may not germinate. Germination will only occur in a specific range of soil temperatures. Um, a little as five degrees Fahrenheit cooler can be the difference between seven day or a 14 day seedling emergence. Moisture is very important. Since a dormant seed only contains 10 to 15 percent moisture, it draws water from the soil that surrounds it. At this early stage, it's critical that moisture levels remain constant for the sprouting process to continue and for the seedling to survive, that it has no method of storing moisture as a mature plant does. You can decrease moisture levels as young seedlings emerge and mature. Uh, the soil is a very important component. Soil from your backyard is too dense, full of weed seeds and loaded with microbes. Sometimes potting soil can be too coarse and too rich in nutrients. A soilless seed starting mix works really well for successful seed germination. It's sterilized so it contains no microorganisms like fungus or mold. It's loose, allowing moisture to easily reach the seed, allowing oxygen to help activate the metabolic process and allows the seedling to freely grow without spending lots of energy in moving the soil to reach the surface. It should contain no chemical agents or supplements like fertilizers or beneficial microbes, because remember that seeds contain all the nutrients they need for the initial stages of life. So if you're purchasing a seed starting mix, make sure you read the ingredients. Kathy will talk a little bit more about making your own seed starting mix. So be familiar with the needs of your seeds, have patience, and enjoy starting your native plants from seed. We want to address today the need for native milkweed in our gardens as a way of helping the declining monarch butterfly population. Milkweeds, which are the sole food source for the monarch caterpillars, have experienced a decline throughout the breeding range of this butterfly due to drastic changes in land use, resulting in the loss of habitat and the prevalent use of pesticides. Milkweed plants are important not only to monarch butterflies, they also support a variety of other butterfly species, along with native bees. These photos show two stages of milkweed seeds. The first photo on the left shows the seeds dark and dry and nearly ready to be taken by the wind. The second photo shows the completely open seed pod and the seeds are already 
dispersing. In order to grow milkweed in your own garden, you want to harvest milkweed seeds when the pods are no longer green, but before they burst and scatter their seeds to the wind. The photo on the left shows a monarch caterpillar on a milkweed plant before pupating. Without milkweed to eat, the monarch larva would not be able to develop into a butterfly. Monarchs also drink nectar from milkweed flowers as butterflies. The photo on the right shows an adult monarch visiting a milkweed flower. These flowers contain a variety of chemical compounds that make monarch caterpillars poisonous to potential predators but are harmless to the monarchs. Remember Janet's comment about coevolution of plants and insects, how they develop codependence and the importance of planting native plants to support the native pollinators. These are some na species of native milkweed in our area that we should add to our gardens in order to benefit our native monarchs. Why are native milkweed important? Native milkweed species are in tune with monarchs' annual migration cycle. In late summer, as milkweed plants start to decline, shorter days and cooler nights signal to developing monarchs that they should delay reproduction and prepare for migration. Because tropical milkweed can live year round in warm climates, monarchs may miss important environmental cues which normally trigger winter migration. Pictured here are the five species of native milkweed that we should plant in our home gardens. From the top left is the common milkweed, Asclepias syriaco, which is the variety of milkweed you see most prominently along the roadsides. Below that is butterfly weed or Asclepias tuberosa, which has vibrant orange flowers, develops a long taproot and grows to a height of around two feet. The top right is swamp milkweed, Asclepias exaltata, Oh, I'm sorry, Asclepias incarnata, and it grows best in a wetter growing environment. Below that is poke milkweed or Asclepias exaltata. It grows to a height of around five feet, which is taller than most other varieties of milkweed, and it's not as aggressive as other varieties. The middle picture, world milkweed, Asclepias fraticillata, is a nice white addition to your garden, reaching a height of around two feet. It blooms into September, which is later than some other milkweed varieties, and provides a late source of nectar to the monarchs before migrating. Although milkweeds seem to proliferate in the wild, they are finicky when it comes to our germinating them, so it's important to follow tested processes. These instructions on how to germinate milkweed are from the website of Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center. It is very important to select milkweed seeds that are native to the northeastern U.S., as we already discussed. According to the Xerces Society, the sources listed on the right are reliable sources of milkweed seeds in the northeast. That's a Plenty Farm also recommends that you buy what they call the monarch supplement to plant along with your milkweed. Giant zinnias, Mexican sunflowers, or tithonia, and purple coneflower, Echinacea purpurea, these three plants bloom in overlapping succession and they provide important nectar calories to the migrating monarchs. So the first step is to start by collecting your materials, plastic bags for the moist germination period, seedling trays with drainage holes and four inch peat pots for later transplanting. You will need three soil mixes. The first mix is the stratification mix which is equal parts perlite and vermiculite. Secondly, you will need a seed germinating mix or seed starting mix, which you can purchase from a garden center. And the third soil mixture is a growing mix, equal parts of sand and compost to be used when you transplant your seeding, seedlings into the four inch pots. These are the steps to follow. Step one is soaking the seeds. This will take several hours or overnight Remember the appearance of the milkweed seeds and how hard they looked. We need to soften the hard seed coat by soaking. The second step is to stratify the moist seeds in your plastic bags in the refrigerator with the moist stratification mix. Refrigerate the seeds for two to four weeks, but this step may take up to 40 days. You should start checking every day after two weeks to see if the seeds are starting to germinate. 
The third step is to germinate the seeds. After the stratification period, transfer the moist seeds with the mix into the trays with drainage holes, which have been filled with damp, not soggy germinating mix. Cover the seeds lightly with the germinating mix. Be aware of damping off, which is a fungal disease that develops in young seedlings in excessively damp conditions. Misting the soil instead of watering will help prevent damping off. Step four is transplanting from the trays into small pots. When one or more sets of true leaves has, has developed, your seedlings will need more room to grow. Then and transplant the seedlings to four inch pea pots. The pea pots work great because they cause the least plant and root disturbance. Plants should sprout in 10 to 15 days. Leave the seedlings in the four inch pots for at least six weeks, allowing time for roots to fully develop before transplanting. And step five is planting outdoors. Plant the seedlings in a cleared area in the ground. When the seedling is no longer, no larger than three inches tall, as many varieties develop along taproot that should not be disturbed. Transplanting in early spring is best and only water during a dry spell. Seed balls or seed bombs is a fun project to do with kids. The basic process is very easy to do as outlined in these instructions from Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center. There are also many sources of seed bomb directions online. You simply mix the base ingredients, add water and your selected seeds, then form the mixture into small balls and dry on wax paper. When dry, they are ready to distribute into the wild. Find an area to bomb where the native perennials will continue to bloom year after year. This is a list of resources that Janet and I used for our presentation. And this, along with several sets of the step-by-step um, -step and instructions uh, will be sent out to you by the various uh, leaders of your master gardeners in your county. So I'll stop sharing. And we'll turn the uh, meeting back over to David. All right. That was great, you guys. Very nice job. We do have a couple questions in the chat box. So again, if anybody uh, is a little late joining us, we're taking the questions in the chat box. So write your question for the chat and we'll go over them after the end of each of these segments. So let's see, uh, here's one question. Is it okay to store seeds in a plastic medication container that has been through the dishwasher? I think again, if you are storing any seeds in plastic, you just have to be sure that they're completely dry before you put them in any plastic container. It's possible to use those containers, but just, you know, exert extra care. Okay, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. What is the source of the milkweed seed slides? And also a list of companion plants again, please. Okay, um, I took those pictures of milkweeds out in my yard and the sources of the seeds. Let's see. Um, there were four that were recommended by the Xerces Society, and people can go on that website if they want uh, to find those sources. And I'm trying to find that slide. Okay, so. Helia Nursery in West Stockbridge, Mass. Helia Native Nursery it is. Native Landscapes Garden Center in Pauling, New York. Wild Seed Project in Portland, Maine. And That's a Plenty Farm in Hadley, Mass. And again, if they go on the Xerces website and look for sources of native milkweed seeds, these uh, nurseries will be listed. Okay, and I think this is kind of along the same lines. Um, what are the names of the other flowers that should be planted to support the monarchs? Oh, that's right. Um, so that's a second question, but it was kind of the, a 
same. It actually, Mike and Becky sent those questions at the same moment. So <laughs> was thinking on the same level. I remember it was zinnias and tithonia. Yes, that this recommendation is from That's a Plenty Farm, the one in Hadley, Mass. And it was giant zinnias, Mexican sunflowers or tithonia, and purple coneflower, echinacea purpurea. Okay, those are all pretty easily found. Yes. That's right, right. So, so you can easily, you know, you could grow those yourself, certainly, or you could probably find seedlings of, at a nursery of most of those, I think. Okay, uh, another question. Have you tried germinating milkweed with winter sowing in the jugs? This will be our first year, yeah. We successfully seeded some last year, and I think Janet did most of that. Mm -hmm. Yes, but we were using the greenhouse. So this year we're gonna be just, our perennial committee is doing everything. We're pretty much winter sowing everything. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, is purple coneflower native here? Yes. Okay. I tried sprouting sumac seeds after following a long procedure I found online. I got nothing from hundreds of seeds. Do you have a source for a good procedure for germinating these plants? Hmm. Well, sumac is a woody plant, yeah. so I might, um, I have a couple sources I'll talk about. Okay, great, great. So, yeah, that would go with your woody plants. Yeah, actually, I can at least point you to a couple books to look in. Uh, do you have more information on native cultivars that perform better than the natives? Um, again, the, the Mount Cuba Center does all that research, and if you go to their website, mountcubacenter.org, it's mtcubacenter.org, um, they have a lot of information on that. So I remember distinctly that there was one variety of phlox that they had tested and recommended, and it was phlox gena, J-E-A-N-A. -A. Um, so that would be a good source for finding native ours that perform at least equally or better than their straight species. Okay, Mount Cuba in Delaware. Mount Ooh. Cuba Center in Delaware. They yeah. do, Doug Tallamy does a lot of work out of there. Yeah, interesting place. Uh, and then there's one more here. It says, I would like to recommend the seed garden, the art and practice of seed saving by Lee Batala and Shane Siegel. So that's a book, The Seed Garden. So thank you everybody for writing in. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And thank you guys. That was really good. Uh, we're going to turn the screen over to Angie. Packed a lot of information in there in a short time. <laughs> and, uh, I think it's a great time of the year to be doing this because we're all confined indoors a lot and uh, wanting to think about spring and getting growing. So uh, this is a lot of good inspiration here. So thank you. All right, great. Well, thank you so much, Shannon and Kathy, for that wonderful presentation. Hopefully that gets everybody excited about uh, maybe practicing some seed saving with natives, if you haven't already. So I'm going to introduce our next speaker, Melissa. She is a uh, Schenectady County Master Gardener volunteer who's been involved in seed saving for the past few years. In 2015, Melissa had the opportunity to take a seed saving course in Tucson, Arizona. She has studied seed saving with Rowan White, a traditional Mohawk seed keeper. Melissa is actually a staff member at the Schenectady Urban Farm where she practices seed saving. So thank you, Melissa. We're going to turn the floor over to you. All right, thank you. I'm going to see if I can get this up. Okay, we can see you. All right, how's that? Uh, yeah, you, I guess it's the, the Zoom screen. What? You can't see my... Uh, you can't see my presentation? No, I see a Zoom screen. Uh, it says I'm sharing. Hmm. Let me. This worked, of course, 
when we tried it earlier. <laughs> Seamlessly, but that's uh, yeah. Do you have do you have your presentation open down the bottom of? of yeah, yeah. It says you are screen sharing. Yeah, and I it, I think we'll um, yeah try try going out and coming back in maybe. Okay. All right. So all right, ready. <laughs> Take two. Okay, yeah, we can see that same Zoom screen. So down the bottom of your screen, do you have some other boxes open? It should be, it should be down there, I would think, and just click on it down there. Um, do I have other things open? No, all I have is my, uh, all right, let me just, all right, let's try this. Okay. Um, now, now can you see it? Yeah, there you go. Yay. Okay. Um, all right. So thank you. What I thought I would do today, I was asked to talk specifically about seed saving with annual seeds. So I'm focusing on annual seeds being those agricultural seeds, things that we grow in our home gardens. Um, we might want to start to save from year to year. Um, so I just put together, um, this is my outline, it, which is, you know, how to, why save seeds, some, a little bit about the botany, and it's great because Janet and Kathy did, had those great photos of the flowers and making seeds, and that's exactly part of um, what I'm going to talk about. A little bit about the seed saving cycle from the perspective of annuals and agriculture and then um, harvesting and cleaning, uh, quality and storage, and then um, seed stewardship. So, um, okay, why save seeds of annuals? Uh, we were some of the, this came up in the last presentation, but it's very cost effective. I, you know, I um, direct these uh, Schenectady Urban Farm. So we have about 1.3 acres of land in Schenectady and just trying to grow. Everyone loves Fortex green beans. Um, they're actually selling out in a lot of places right now. And I located some yesterday and it's going to cost $95 for two pounds of Fortex beans that will seed 850 feet. Um, and we will definitely be saving some of those seeds because those are seeds to save and they're fairly easy seeds to save. Um, local varieties, when you save seeds, you can have more access to local varieties, both what you're saving and then if you get involved in trading um, as well. Um, we have cultural connections to, to our seeds, to our ancestral lineages and the, the foods that we have and the, the stories that are connected, the things that connect us both to, um, well, both to the, our, our lineage, but also to our communities. And maybe that is also the communities that we're located in now in our regions. Uh, um, genetic diversity, when we participate in saving seeds, we also participate in maintaining genetic diversity, which we know is really, really important. Um, prior to 1800, all farmers uh, saved and swapped seeds and that there, there were many, many, many more varieties and many varieties that were uh, region specific. And we've lost a lot of diversity and especially in, over the past uh, two years, there's been a consolidation of seed companies. So currently, four seed companies control over 60% of the world's seed or the global seed market. Um, and then just an ability to, um, to have to generate plants that can um, are more adapted to your climate and soil. When we save seeds and grow those seeds year after year, after about seven plant generations, um, a seed variety will have remarkable adaptions to your unique place of planting. And that means that it can withstand sudden insect infestation or 
uh, shifting climate. So I think especially now as we're coming to terms with climate change, um, um, saving seeds and maintaining a genetic diversity is, is we're realizing how important that is. And then that's all connected to strengthening seed and food security. We've you know, seen with the pandemic what happens how easily supply lines can get cut or transportation systems can break down. Right now, so many people are growing seed, uh, gardens that there are seed shortages. So saving your own seeds for annuals for your gardens or as part of a community seed bank is part of strengthening seed and food security. And it's delicious. So, um, you know, this is um, I when I did a training in seed saving at Native Seed Search in Tucson. Um, this was the lunch they served us, and it came from food grown from seeds that they had stewarded, and it was delicious. And you know, it's a variety of tastes. Um, so, where to start? Um, Start with good seed. That's the most important thing. And th through the whole process, you always want to save your best seeds. Um, your healthy you, you and you take the seeds from the healthiest plants as well. So it's it's really important as you're as you're growing for seed to be aware of um, watching the plant as it's growing, keeping track, and then um, saving the really the best seeds. So one of the things that's helpful is knowing the seed types because the best seeds, if you want to start saving annuals and, and even maybe steward seeds, which would be that you take responsibility for a, a particular um, seed that you continue to grow and maintain the variety year after year, um, knowing uh, what seeds, what kinds of seeds are help. So, um, the easiest seeds to steward are called true to type seeds. And these are seeds where it's easiest to save them, replant them, and the same plant grows. Um, so we get this in a variety of ways. Most of our agriculture until very, very recently, all of our plants, all of the, most of the food we eat now, the delicious watermelon and, and potatoes and corn, all come from open pollinated seeds. So seeds that are pollinated by wind, birds, <clears throat> insects, the plants um, are naturally varied in that way. And this is really, like I said, our oldest way of uh, saving seeds. And then in doing that over eons, farmers and gardeners would select the varieties that had the beneficial traits that they were looking for, maybe drought tolerance, um, maybe a good flavor. And we've been doing this for as long as we've been doing agriculture. Um, and so when a gardener is working with open pollinated plants, one of the things you have to be aware of, and we'll get into this a little bit more later, is um, that you have to have a certain isolation distance with plants and knowing what the, the varieties are so that um, you have to keep the pollen from other related varieties from crossing when you're trying to grow a specific variety out. Um, then we ha also have hybrids. So hybrids are F1. There's a picture on the right from Johnny's. Um, so for it, hybrids are, um, plants developed through a, a very specific controlled cross of parents and plant breeders are, you know, direct the process. So Johnny's Selected Seeds has on staff plant breeders and they make sure that those seed lines get maintained. And hybrids are some of the hardest to try and grow from uh, to save seeds from because you're starting with two different parents. Um, and so for instance, that's in knowing that, so if you're, say you know you wanna save seeds, you love tomatoes, tomatoes are generally easy to, to save. And at least where we are, everyone loves the sun gold tomatoes, um, but sun gold tomatoes are a hybrid tomato or F1. And so to try and just it's not impossible. It's sort of like the advanced sort of next level after beginning saving um, would be to experiment with saving hybrid seeds and, and breeding. Um, heirloom seeds are open pollinated seeds with a story, with a history. Um, 
And then the, the, this has been very interesting to me that as I've learned about, they're called land race or Grex plants. And so their land race is not a standardized variety, but a diverse population with similar characteristics. So um, it's, these are usually developed through traditional farming. Um, so the plants and seeds are selected on site by the farmers. M most seed companies don't sell land races because of the variety, um, but they are starting to sell them now, which is interesting. Um, and land races, and I actually have an example, land races provide critical genetic diversity for future crop improvement. Uh, and their diversity also makes them resilient in the face of any kind of extreme weather or insects. And so this is an example of um, a seed company, the Experiential, Experimental Seed Network, and um, a land race squash that they're growing. And so you can see the, um, the variety of squash that you get from it. Uh, but that variety means there's this incredible genetic diversity, and then people will grow and you keep selecting year after year from the what you like. Maybe it's the color, maybe it's the flavor, and then eventually you have this squash plant that is adapted to your location um, and grows best in your conditions and can with, with, withstand more stress too. Uh, the other uh, thing to know is the Latin name of the plant. So you want to know um, so that you don't have um, crosses. So that, for instance, zucchini, pumpkin, acorn squash, spaghetti squash, patty pan squash, summer squash, they are all of the same, um, they're all of the same species. And so if you were growing them too close to each other and you're trying to save the seed, there's a risk of those um, of cross-pollination so that the, the plants that you would get after that might not be the plants that you were growing and expecting. But then also that's how you get new varieties as well too. Um, so also you want to know and um, the sort of the next part from that picture of how the, the flowers and the seeds get made is when you're saving seed, whether plants are, they call them selfies or crossers, whether a flower is self-fertile, that is, it's able to use pollen from its own flowers to reproduce, or whether it is a crosser, meaning it relies on pollen from another plant of the same variety. And so usually self-fertile um, plants and seeds tend to be easier to uh, maintain seed and easier if you want to start uh, saving seed. And so some of those, and I'll talk, I'll, I'll have some um, pictures of e examples, um, but would be beans, tomatoes, lettuce. Um. All right, so the seed saving cycle. So sort similar to the plant cycle, and I want to just talk about it a little bit in terms of, I'm thinking not so much people who are growing seed as seed farmers, but growing seed as gardeners um, or maybe small farms. So you might be growing and harvesting that food to eat and saving some of the seed. And so there's different strategies depending on the plant, but you're planting those seeds um, it just to uh, save or to, to grow and to eat. And then as they grow, you are being attentive to the growth. Um, Rowan White, the um, seed keeper that I've studied with for two years now, calls it a reverent curiosity, that we want to maintain a reverent curiosity towards always what's happening, what's going on, and you know, rogue out unwanted plants. And I think sometimes that's the hardest, is to just, re like, the one, and, and, and it is really important for the, to, you know, to maintain um, vitality of the plants. So then you have um, what's called isolation, and that is knowing the distance that you need to plant um, th those plants apart so that they don't cross. And that is gonna depend on what you're growing. And again, it's gonna be easier if you are trying to save from plants that are self-fertile uh, than crossers. 
uh, maturation. Similarly, so if you are a gardener and you're growing both to eat and to harvest, um, some seed crops are grown in the same manner as their food components. So tomatoes, peppers, watermelon, squash, dry beans, and we say you can stack functions. So you can eat the fruit of the flesh, and then you also have the added benefit of the seeds that you save. And that means that the seeds, the maturation, the seeds are mature and ready to be uh, cleaned and saved at the same time that that food is ready for us to eat. And there are some plants that need this an extra cycle to reach the stage where they can create edible seeds. So that would be like brassicas, lettuce, spinach, cucumbers. So you would want to, if you're growing them, make sure that when you're harvesting, first of all, that you're leaving some of the best ones and that you're letting them, you, you're harvesting some to eat, but then there's going to be a significant amount that you leave and you let mature. And so you need to make sure that you've planted in time to um, allow that to happen for the plant to develop a mature seed. And then the harvest um, cleaning, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more in detail about different approaches for that with annual seeds um, and then the seed storage. And I'll also get into that as well. So someone already said this before, I highly, highly recommend this book. Um, and this is where I, I have it in the resources as well. Um, it's a really good um, overall, you know, any, all the information here I'm sharing is some of it I have gotten from this book and I know all of it's in there. Um, this was the textbook that I've used as I've been studying. And they also go through so that when you're starting to do this, they have all of the seeds, the plants listed out individually. And it's, you know, how do you go about saving the seeds? And, and important questions like, if you're a gardener and you want to grow seeds and you want to keep maintaining that variety, how many plants do you need to grow to maintain the variety? Because usually it's more than one. You usually need to, and again, that's also about diversity. Um, so some, some plants require more than others. And so, um, anyways, this is, is a really excellent reference book that I highly recommend. This is it's probably more than anyone needs, but it's just once you are, um, if you're getting interested in saving seeds, and you can see there's all sorts of things that we're, we want to really keep track of besides the name and the variety and the seed source, but all, all the when did it get planted, um, the transplanting, the depth, you know, what was going on. And that's where even having a daily journal, that was part of what we needed to do um, to really watch like what's happening, what's changing, what are you noticing? Um, that is probably can't overemphasize enough. So dry seed processing. Um, I think some of the easiest, uh, and this would be like I was saying, you could start, you could plant um, bean seeds and you could let them dry and you could take them down and save them and replant them the next year. And th they're really the easiest. They're also, they're self-fertile. Um, they're the easiest to, to save. And they're also really beautiful. Um, these are some that I've grown and two that I'm stewarding. The one on the left are Haudenosaunee skunk beans, which are a kind of kidney bean. They're big. They grow really tall. Uh, they're delicious. Um, uh, and the one on the bottom right is the other one. It's a uh, Six Nations strawberry bean. And um, it's another bean. It grows really well. It's, it's more of a pinto bean but um, equally delicious and um, equally uh, heir heirloom with um, important stories. So th these are, and it's interesting too, like <clears throat> the, we grew the seeds this year. So on the right, those are the strawberry beans growing. We had them grow up the sunflowers. Uh, they like 
went eight feet and started pulling the sunflowers down, which was very surprising. This was this, this is the beginning of this year's harvest of the beans. So you can see, like for instance, if I was gonna save the beans, um, I'm probably, unless I wanted to start focusing on a variety where there's more red, I'm probably gonna save the ones where they're a little bit more mottled or a little bit striped, or I just think the color's prettier or they're larger, more vibrant. You can see too from this picture that the color uh, it changes like that. Those are the seeds at a, almost a year later as we're getting ready to plant them. And then these are the seeds just after they've been dried and, and threshed. And so this, so dry processing for seeds. So for bean seeds, what I don't have a picture of would be the step right before this. So on the left, they are, um, finishing cleaning black bean seeds. And we started by putting all of those dried seed pods into a pillowcase and then literally walking on the pillowcase or smashing it on the ground. And then the, um, that outer dried part breaks away, the heavier seeds fall to the bottom and then we pour the seeds off. And then what they're doing is going through where there are maybe some still stuck in there. It's also good because it's, um, you know, it's labor intensive. So if you have a lot of people, it's a good way to participate in all working together and then also have a conversation about seeds and saving seeds. But there's also a process, a part two after you've done that where you need to winnow, um, which also came up in the last. And this is when you're pouring the seeds. So here they're pouring it in front of a fan. This is kind of the last step in getting that uh, chaff to clean off. On the top, there's another, this would be another dry seed processing of um, corn seed. And then the other pictures are screens. And so screening is something that you often need to do with the smaller seeds. Like, so this wouldn't be the case so much for, for corn or the beans that I was showing. Um, this is actually, I think, safflower that is being screened. But um, with screens, the seeds are run through a series of screens that are made of different size hardware cloth. The idea is you have two, at least two screens stacked on top of each other so that the debris that's larger than the seed remains in the top screen while the lower screen uh, catches the seed but allows the smaller debris to fall out the bottom. And so or, or sometimes you may need three screens if the seeds are very small, like, like if you're saving lettuce seeds. So I don't have a picture of, but an example of a seed that's fairly easy to save, but you definitely would want to be screening and winnowing are uh, lettuce seeds. They're very, very, very tiny. Um, and so, Again, after you're doing that, then you're um, winnowing. And I don't know why, I always love this because part of me never believed that you could actually pour these seeds in front of a fan and everything wouldn't just blow away. But you, 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 know, you have to control the speed of the fan, um, but it really works. Um, there's lots of, uh, lots of low tech stuff we can do to grow and maintain our food. Um, so the next one is um, <clears throat> wet seed processing. So basically there's dry seed processing and wet seed processing when it comes to saving annual seeds or annual vegetable seeds. Um, this is one of the most fun ones to save for us. This is watermelon. This is Blacktail Mountain watermelon. So we started growing it because it is a short season one and um, we're hoping to continue growing it out so it gets adapted to our particular sandy soil in Schenectady. Um, but it's a great way because the first thing that you do is once it's, it's a, a plant that the seed is ready when the fruit is mature. So when the watermelon's ready, we harvested it and we enjoyed eating it. And then we saved out the best seeds, the seeds that were fully developed and rinsed them really well with a colander. And then, <clears throat> put them on a, on a, what's on a coffee filter to dry. Um, so that would be one, <clears throat> one kind of wet processing. Um, another one, we grow a lot of tomatoes. Um, the tomato, we grow, we haven't at this point 
um, limited the varieties enough to really try and save tomato seeds. Um, it's one I'm hoping we're going to start by doing with um, the paste, paste tomatoes. There's a opalka paste tomato that originally, well not originally, I think it originally comes from Poland and then it's been in Amsterdam, New York for a long time. So um, we've, that's one that we have been growing for a couple of years and we're trying to narrow down to just growing one and then saving the seeds. Um, so wet seed crops, um, they hold the seed within that, the succulent fruit, like the watermelon or the tomato, the cucumbers. You have to first take the seed out of the fruit. Um, and this can mean, you know, squashing the tomato or, um, you know, again, it's something that you can be, you can remove the seeds and still eat the tomato. Um, and then, and I don't, I couldn't find a picture of my own doing it. Um, this is from the seed garden when an example of if you want to, it, so this is the second wet process and it's when you need to ferment the seeds and fermenting them is that that gelatinous coating that some seeds will have, like particularly one example would be the tomato seeds. Um, you wanna remove that coating before you store them. And so you do that by squeezing the seeds into a container and covering them with water and then mixing them. This is a, about a one to three process, a one to three day process for the fermentation. Um, and then the viable seeds will actually start to sink, will sink to the bottom. The, the seeds that are not viable will float on the top and then you'll get this fermentation. So you'll see a, a kind of growth on the top. So after any, you know, just depending on how quickly this happens, um, you pour off that top. So you're pouring off the seeds that are floating that are not viable, the water. And then you're, you have that remaining, those seeds at the bottom that are viable, that you're then pouring into a colander, rinsing really well, and then putting out to dry. So here again, this is um, on a coffee filter. Um, so seed quality and storage. Um, each type of seed has a different storage life. And when seeds are completely dry, they can be frozen and stored for a much longer time. And I, Janet and Kathy talked, um, I, I think, ab about um, a lot about that too. And so I won't go on for too long about that. Um, seed quality is influenced by timely harvest, timely drying. Um, and that then influences how long you can store your seeds and how long those seeds remain viable. Most seeds stored by like a home gardener, small farmer, um, will remain viable for two to six years. And then depending on your seed saving skills, um, maybe longer. There are, and so you can see for like for this example, this is one of the ways that I keep track of the seeds. There's actually a label on the top and there's a label inside. So I have the name, um, and then just a little bit about the growing conditions that year and also the date because you don't necessarily have um, have to grow the seeds out every year but if you're saving seed and you're um, you want to keep maintaining that variety you do need to grow them out usually within a five-year period um, another way that, that seeds are stored sort of larger these seed banks. Um, this comes from Native Seed Search. So this is a, a climate controlled environment inside um, with seeds that they steward um, both as um, seeds go out to indigenous people first and then they have members. Members can purchase seeds and then they sell seeds also um, in Tucson. So these are our seeds that are specifically adapted for arid climates. Um, and so the other thing is in terms of seed storage, for most of us, we're looking at storing for just really a few years where there are these seed um, banks, like I think there's one, it's in Iceland, where there are these huge vaults and they're storing seeds in these really like um, dry, cold, cold conditions. And the idea is if there's some sort of 
catastrophe, you still have these, you know, this germoplasm, these, these genetics available. But at the same time, it's the farmers and gardeners who are maintaining the variety. Those are the ones in terms of being able to feed us from year to year that are going to be more successful because as you're doing that, the seeds are changing. The earth is changing. You're growing out the plants. Those plants are changing and adapting as well. So there's, you know, you may, we may want to have seeds stored away in that way, but to store seeds and really to be able to maintain them um, and to also maintain them in the face of climate change, we do need to be growing them out fairly regularly. Um, so finally, just seed stewardship. Um, you know, I, the way that I learned about seed keeping was from a perspective, an indigenous perspective, that it was about our relationship with plants, it was about our relationship um, to the earth, to agriculture, that we have a responsibility to maintain these seeds for future generations, um, you know, for the sake of nourishment for our communities and also maintaining our own uh, cultural and ancestral traditions. There's a lot um, with seed stewardship that, um, you know, people start to talk about seed sovereignty now. So that, and I think again, going back to the power and importance of diversity in local varieties, what I saw happening when I was in Tucson for about 10 years, um, the native people there, the Tohono O'odham, and they had really high, high instances of diabetes, heart disease, uh, metabolic diseases, and then what they, the Tohono O'odham started doing was returning to their native food sources. They started growing out again the seeds that, they, that their culture had grown for a long, long time. And they found that when they started eating those traditional foods again, that those health issues started to diminish significantly. And so that whole, and that's part of this food sovereignty movement for people, both about impact a sense of empowering themselves in terms of health, uh, in terms of food security, and in terms of, you know, sustaining their community and culture. Um, and then similarly, I, these are the, the resources that I used in putting this together. Um, a seed save a program I've been part of now. There's a, the breeding organic vegetables. You can actually get free as a PDF online if you put that information in. You can also buy it from NOFA as a, a printed. Um, Fruition Seeds is a local seed source and they sell regional seeds um, and have lots of good, that's a link to information on seed starting and a lot of their courses they're offering for free right now. Um, there's um, the, then we had said the seed garden and then just, you know, getting involved. I was thinking as master gardeners, you know, we might want to be looking at creating um, community seed banks, uh, starting seed swaps. I know in Schenectady, we actually had hoped to start a seed swap this January. Um, at this point, it just doesn't look like we're going to, we definitely are not going to plan anything in person. Um, but we are, at least through Schenectady Urban Farms, looking to become what's called a regional seed hub so that we would both be, we'll be giving out seeds uh, this spring and we'll also be um, possibly taking in seeds from companies that are donating them and then packaging them up in smaller packages, redistributing them, and then following up with information on growing and seed saving. Um, and then this comes through this Cooperative Gardens Commission. Um, so that is where we've gotten involved with the regional seed hub. And that is what I have um, in terms of saving seeds for annual crops. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. That was great. Wonderful. Lots of good information there. Uh, let's see. We have a couple things in the chat box. Uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. Okay, my granddaughter brought me some arugula seeds from Guatemala. I've had two seasons of seeds 
from these plants. An illegal import, but the arugula tastes great. <laughs> I guess that's not a question, it's an observation, right? But that's like, those are like the seed stories, you know, and that's part of what makes seed saving uh, so wonderful, because there's yeah. great stories. Uh, and also another comment, this is from the previous uh, segment, New York Plant Atlas shows that Echinacea purpurea is not native to Albany County. Okay. Yeah, I think it's from the Midwest. Okay, here's one. Do musk melons cross-pollinate with anything in the squash family? I have saved seeds from Bender Surprise Melons. Yeah, so you would want to, to look at the that first species name on the list for the musk, which I just don't know off the top of my head. I'm sorry. That's why I love this book um, because, um, you know, you can just go in to the back and you can look up, but you have to look it up by the, the Latin name and it will tell you um, about the musk melons. And I probably won't be able to find it quick enough to answer but so but I don't so I don't I don't know off the top of my head but you would want it to to look at the species name okay uh, where do you find the distances to prevent unwanted cross-pollination yeah that's what you would find in a in a book like that this it gives you it's like a, 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 a whole um, appendix in the back that'll give you the name of the plant the family the flower type um, whether it's right self-fertile or crossing, um, and then how many you need to save for variety or genetic maintenance, how far isolation distances are needed. Um, yeah. Okay. I think a lot of people are going to be buying the book. It's a really good book. <laughs> are you familiar with The Sower, a Julie Perrone film? No, I'm familiar with Parable of the Sower by Octavia Butler, um, which is a science fiction book, but I am not familiar with the Sower. Okay, here's one I think you answered, but we'll mention it anyway. Uh, any experience with storing and then planting seeds several years after the initial harvesting? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. If you've, if you've dried the seeds and you've stored them in the correct conditions, you sh unless, I mean, there are some seeds that are, like onion seeds are very, very short-lived. Um, but most, with the seeds that I was talking about today are, are longer-lived, and yes, you should be able to do that. Uh, let's see, Voorheesville Public Library, prior to COVID time, had a seed swap area. Yeah. Uh, as, so long as the genus is different, they shouldn't cross-pollinate, or should it be by family? Um, I think that, that is a very good question. Yeah, I think that was back to the squash. Yeah, um, because I under I understand it as family, but I but but that's a good question. Um, I think in the squash family, a lot of things can cross. Uh, oh, I, that is yeah. yeah, and I have to say, it, and and because we're a community farm and we're growing so many different things, I have. I haven't attempted um, saving seeds from any of the squashes, um, although sometimes they replant themselves in the compost area. Um, okay, uh, Bethlehem Public Library gets seeds from companies, package them up and you choose the packets you want. Again, pre-COVID, when things get better, they'll most probably get back to it. Yeah. Uh, I have Allen's tomato. I have grown for 30 years. Oh, that's awesome. So there's a seed saver, Martha Ann. Uh, uh, where do you get Black Mountain watermelon? So those seeds, um, and I'm sorry, Black Tail Mountain watermelon, Black Tail Mountain. Um, um, Johnny's, I, I think we've got, we got them originally through Fedco, um, Johnny's seeds. I think fruition seeds, a lot of seed companies that focus on northern growers because it was specifically developed in Idaho for short, cool seasons. Mm, here's an interesting one. Is it accurate to assume that an exotic annual could not become invasive? That's a little bit off the subject, but 
I don't think that's accurate to assume because there's that uh, annual tear thumb vine that's a very terrible, exotic, invasive south of us, and it's an annual. Mm. I don't know. Did you have any yeah. other thoughts on I that? No idea. Yeah. 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 I think annuals can become exotic invasives. Yeah. Not as commonly, maybe, but I think it can happen. Yeah. Uh, here's one for the other group, really. When do you pull down milkweed plants? I don't know if any of those guys are here and they can chime in. We're here. We're just, uh, can you re repeat the question? It says, when do you pull down milkweed plants? That sounds rather violent. Like uh, maybe the, is that um, maybe like when do you uh, cut them back or? I think that's what they mean. Yeah. Well, it kind of depends on where you want the Yeah. If um, some of the um, milkweed spreads aggressively, so if you and want to control the colony, you would probably cut it down before it goes to seed. Otherwise, our, our native perennial philosophy is to leave plants in the garden until spring because they provide food and shelter for a lot of um, native pollinators and birds and food. And so they, they could be good to keep in the garden unless you don't want it to spread yeah, I think it's, they wrote in again so that the monarchs aren't disturbed. So that's what they're thinking of, I think. Oh, okay. Yeah, that okay. makes sense. Okay. I think that's all the questions we have at the moment. Well, I want to thank you, Melissa. That was really great. Lots of really good information and a lot of good, interesting projects out there going on out in the world. Um, so I think... We have a little bit of time left. I'm going to talk about my woody plants. So I'm going to share my screen and see if I can make this thing work. Okay. So let's see. Do, 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 do. Okay. So here we go. Uh, let's see. There we are. So hopefully everybody can see that. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about growing woody plants from seed. And I'll try to really keep this short because we uh, come almost to the end of our time, which is perfectly fine. But I think my purpose today is to mostly get people just thinking about this subject because this is not something many people do. And maybe there's good reasons for it, but I'm a little odd. I've always been a, the kind of person that likes to try different things. So um, this, this is something I've done a little bit of, growing woody plants from seed. And I would just say very briefly, our world is rather disturbed and blighted and ugly. So let's try to grow some trees and repopulate the earth with trees. And here's a picture of a tree that's an ash tree dying in East Greenbush. And when this was cut down, nothing was replanted. So even though this is in a barren parking lot, you'd say, well, who cares? At least there was one tree in the parking lot and now there are none. So we as master gardeners and cooperative extension people and horticulture people have to really keep after everybody that we need trees. Uh, but I don't have time to grow a tree from seed. I've heard that from a lot of people. And I'm gonna try to allay your fears here. We can grow a lot of trees up to some certain uh, substantial size in just a few years. So if you think you have a couple years left on the planet, <laughs> I would urge you to give this a try. And also it's a wonderful thing to leave as a legacy if you've got children or grandchildren or, or people that you know that are younger, um, having them experience a tree that they helped grow maybe or they knew somebody that grew that, that's a legacy. So legacy trees are an important thing too. And as you uh, have heard before, uh, saving money. We can grow trees from seed and save a lot of money. Certainly, trees are expensive. You go to a nursery and you see a lot of money for a tree. So maybe we can grow our own and do some community support that way. And of course, as we've said before, growing things is fun. So I won't 
go into the plant development so much there, but as we said before, um, how is growing seed different, uh, growing things from seed different than other ways we propagate? Well, one of them is variability. Um, so you're going to have variability of seed propagated plants, which in a lot of ways is a good thing. Uh, nurseries don't always think that. They want uniformity a lot of times, but we often uh, can benefit from variability, um, especially in woody plants, because we want a wider range of genetics out in the landscape. And certainly, it's not that hard of a project to do. You can use a little bit of your time and have a lot of fun and grow a lot of different plants. So here's uh, what I want to talk about next was what to grow. Why would you want to do this? Well, pick out something you've always wanted. This is a picture of bayberry. And I grew bayberry when I was in college as a propagation project. And bayberry isn't native to this part of New York State, but it's native to the coastal regions. And I've grown bayberry from seed just because it was kind of fun to do and have in the, in the garden. Uh, something you've always uh, wanted to grow, maybe something that's available, you found the seeds for free. Certainly there's seeds all over the place. If we watch and we look carefully, we can find lots of woody plants we can try. Maybe something that has some kind of sentimental attachment. Maybe you have a favorite plant or a favorite tree of past years and you'd like to try to grow it again. Certainly you can buy woody plant seeds online. Uh, Sheffields, which I think I'll show you uh, in a minute, uh, is one place where you can buy lots of different woody plant seeds, but you can get a lot of them for free. Um, and I wouldn't get up on, hung up on what am I gonna do with the plants? Just try it, see what you're gonna do, and you'll never know, maybe there's a park or some kind of land conserva uh, conservancy or friends, neighbors that wouldn't mind having a couple other woody plants on their property. And here's one of the examples that I've grown in the past. On the left-hand side is a picture of some of my Kentucky coffee, tree, coffee trees. Uh, this is a tree that I learned about when I was in graduate school. I've always been kind of fascinated by it. It's uh, not native to this part of the United States. It's native to Ohio, Kentucky, that area. Uh, it may have lived here at one time before the Ice Age. Uh, so it's a very interesting tree and one that you can propagate from seeds. And you can find one or two of these in the Capital District and I've grown others from those trees and uh, propagated them on. And another one that's a little bit more common is the redbud. Um, on my street, there were a lot of old redbud trees and the seeds would fall, oh, they would fall into the street, so they were legal for me to pick up, and I've grown redbud seed, uh, redbud trees from those seeds and kept them alive in our neighborhood. Uh, beautiful, beautiful tree, and not really that hard to grow from seed. Um, so just like we've heard before, each of these species has its own requirements for germination. They have a dormancy, perhaps. They need certain types of light, soil, moisture, temperature. And then there's always other little tricks for, with each type of seed, I think. Uh, the example here of the trick is that oak seeds are often infested with weevils. So if we're gonna grow oak trees, we float the seeds in water and we test them for soundness. And I think Melissa alluded to something like that with some of the seeds floating. And the floaters, in the case of the oak seeds, are probably infested with weevils and we wouldn't uh, keep those or try to grow them because they're not gonna be viable. Uh, some of the references, which I'll send to you uh, by the email as well. Uh, the first book there, Seeds of Woody Plants in North America uh, by Young and Young. That's one of the classics, and that's actually a reprint of an old government document. There's not a lot of uh, information on growing woody plants from seed readily available out in the world. That book probably is hard to find, but it's got a lot of good researched information in it. Uh, the middle book there is by Michael Durr, D-I-R-R, -R, and a lot of you will know Durr's Woody uh, Landscape Plant Manual, and this is one he wrote on propagation, which is a very useful book. And then the Ken Drew's Making More Plants book is a little bit more uh, wide-ranging. It's not just about uh, woody plants. It's about growing all sorts of plants in all different ways, but it's got some good information in it. And if you really want to go down the rabbit hole of propagating from seed, go online and Google Norman Dino, D-E-N-O, maybe, and put in the word seed or seeds, 
And he was a professor of chemistry who actually became very interested in seed propagation and literally studied thousands of plants for how you could get them to germinate from seed. And his uh, manuals are online in different formats. They're a little hard to find, but, and you have to kind of decode his writing. <laughs> but if you want to figure out how to grow some kind of obscure seed, it would be a Norman Dino, perhaps. Uh, and of course, you know, you can find anything online, so, so go Google it. Uh, here's Sheffield's. Here's a list. Sheffield's.com is a New England, I believe, a purveyor of woody plant seeds. And they have lots of information on their website. Here's a list I just uh, cobbed from them of easy to grow woody uh, plant species from seed, which is kind of interesting. But Sheffield's will sell you seeds and uh, has lots of interesting things on their website. And certainly collecting from a uh, garden, a hybrid may or may not be net, uh, desirable, as I think Melissa talked a lot about. Uh, hybrids don't come true from seeds, and that's certainly true from woody plants as well. Um, if you want to grow an apple tree, we get that question in the office once in a while. I, I have this apple that I really like in my backyard. I want to grow another tree. What happens if I plant a seed? Well, apple will not come true from seed. You'll get something else. But in some ways that's an advantage because you may get something better or something interesting, but you're not gonna necessarily get um, your same plant. So always keep in the back of your mind, is it a hybrid or is it not? And that does hold true with woody plants as well, although a lot of woody plants are not hybrids, so you will get them to come true from seed pretty easily. So collecting seeds, well, the timing of course is gonna be important. It's often in the late summer or the fall. We got to keep our eyes peeled and I walk around with plastic bags in my pockets because I pick up interesting seeds and put them in my pockets. And you've got to always remember to clean your pockets out. But you find lots of interesting things when you're out walking around. You might think, well, that's an interesting tree. Maybe I'll just try to propagate that for fun. And often we have to try to beat the wildlife to it. And uh, the critters are out there looking for all these different types of fruits that might be fleshy fruits, not like uh, seeds, dry capsules, and certainly the conifers. And we all have seen squirrels busy feeding on uh, spruce uh, seeds, pine nuts, things like that. So the wildlife often beats us to it when we're trying to collect woody plant seeds. Now the timing is also important because some woody plants have seeds that mature very quickly and disperse very quickly. So if you're not there at the right time, almost immediately things like fir, poplar, willow are going to disperse and you're going to not be able to find them. So here's a picture of a beautiful con color fir cone and when that cone matures a little bit more and opens up those seeds are going to just drop very quickly and you may not be able to find them uh, then. Other species are around for a long time. I can go out <laughs> probably 12 months of the year and find acorns in my backyard uh, oaks tend to stay around for a long time, although wildlife really does like to eat them. So if you are looking for oaks, you do want to get out there and collect those acorns. And black walnut is another one. They will stick around for a while, but if you've got a lot of wildlife, and we all know we have a lot of wildlife, they do tend to disappear too. So here's a little example. I have a tree in my backyard called an umbrella magnolia. Again, a native to south of us. It might have been native here uh, before the Ice Age. Um, I didn't grow it from seed, but I've always wanted to try to propagate it. Uh, there's a large white flower for a very short time period, and then it forms this aggregated follicle, this interesting uh, cone-like structure where the seeds are inside. It ripens in late fall, and then that bottom picture there you can see is the dry uh, uh, follicle releasing those bright red or orange seeds. And you have to really be there when that happens. That happens over a period of maybe a couple weeks. And if you're not paying attention, those seeds probably get eaten by wildlife because they disappear. And you've got to really be on top of it. Uh, so what you can do is you can collect that follicle a little early, put it in a warm place, and then it will continue to mature. And then you can get those seeds out. So the seed is in those orange structures. That's a fleshy covering on it. So each plant is a little different, just like the woody, uh, the herbaceous plants and the vegetable plants. Each one has its own 
tricks of how you want to propagate it. Uh, so the seed may or may not need to be cleaned. Often we do want to clean the seeds. Uh, so apple, walnut, osage, orange, ginkgo, all of these really have fleshy fruits over the seed and we want to clean those. Now, the walnut, the picture on the top there, uh, if you've ever tried to do that, wear gloves because that walnut husk or that fleshy fruit really has some chemicals in there uh, that will stain your hands. <laughs> and that was used for a dye at one time. But then you have that walnut underneath. And I'll just mention the bottom picture there with the leaves, that's a ginkgo. Now, if you've ever seen a ginkgo tree drop fruit and uh, make a mess on a sidewalk and then people step on it, you know that that fruit is hideously pungent. It smells, unfortunately, like dogs have been in the area um, and left their calling cards. But you can remove that fruit and grow a ginkgo tree from seed. And I have two ginkgo trees in my front yard, probably 20, 25 feet tall now that were grown from seed. Uh, from a tree in Troy, which is a really kind of cool thing to do. Um, just a fun kind of activity. Uh, ginkgo trees don't produce seed for many, many years, and you don't know if you have a female or a male. So you're really getting into crazy botany here uh, by propagating from seed. And as Melissa and the others said, uh, we do need to wash away germ uh, inhibiting chemicals in fruits. And the tomato, of course, is the classic one. Here's another one in the woody plant world, the quince. If you wanted to propagate a quince, uh, that fruit also has inhibitors in the, in the fruit that are not going to allow the seed to germinate. Other woody plant seeds need very little cleaning. The sugar maple we're all familiar with is really a, basically a naked seed practically. And birch will come out of these, those catkins very easily and uh, really doesn't need a lot of cleaning. Uh, the pines, you just tap a pine cone after it's dried and the seeds will fall out as long as the seeds are still there. So it really varies in how much cleaning you need to do. Uh, my umbrella magnolia example, we would want to take those uh, fleshy fruit, uh, covered seeds, rub them on a screen, soak them over overnight or for a couple days, change the water, dry them, and then store them. So there is a little bit of work there, but uh, we could produce a nice uh, packet of seeds there with not too much uh, effort. If we all really pay attention to the timing, I think that's really the most important thing with these woody plants. So once we've cleaned and dried the seeds, what do we need to do? We might need to stratify it, scarify it, both of those things, maybe some kind of combination, or we might need to plant it right away. Again, each species is going to be different. Um, seeds with thin coats, tend to lose viability quickly. Some seeds really don't last all that long um, if we don't treat them right. Now an oak or a walnut, which is on that list, that seed can last for quite a while. If we treat it correctly, we would want to uh, stratify both of those, put them in cold storage. I know the horse chestnut, which is on this list, is a very tricky one to grow from seed because the seed doesn't retain its viability very long. I think you need to plant that one rather quickly. We tried to grow horse chestnut when I was in graduate school for a project and we had a devil of a time trying to grow it from seed. So um, each one is tricky or can be tricky depending on what species it is. Uh, in general the seeds should be stored about that 30 uh, to 40 degrees and the humidity should be low and they should be in sealed containers for a long-term storage like uh, our other speakers have said. And refrigerators can be a great place to store things uh, you can use a, a number of different types of uh, bottles, film canisters, plastic bags, whatever you have on hand. But again, as they said before, make sure they're clean and dry and labeled. Labeling is very important, especially if you're going to put it in your refrigerator. You don't want somebody to come along and think those are edible or something or, or you're going to forget what they are. I've had seed boxes in our refrigerator for a long time and I make sure I try to keep it way down in the back and, and keep it all labeled and uh, clean it out once in a while. So some seeds have a dormancy period, others do not. Um, this dormancy might be caused by a hard seed coat or the uh, embryo might be immature and needs a period of uh, ripening. And each one again is gonna be a little bit different. Uh, here's some old information from USDA, which I'm always fond of. They studied 400 species of woody plants 33% had seeds that were commonly non-dormant and could just be ready to grow. 
7% had impermeable seed coats, 43% had some kind of internal dormancy of the seed, and 17% had more than one kind of dormancy. So again, very variable. So how do we overcome dormancy? We might uh, give it a warm temperature period, a cold temperature period in a moist condition uh, to give that embryo time to mature. But again, those temperature uh, requirements are gonna vary with each species. Uh, we might use what's called stratification, which is a long-term uh, cold moist storage usually, or we might need to use scarification, and that's something we haven't talked about yet today, so I definitely want to touch upon that. Stratification and scarification. Now, stratification, this is a picture out of my old textbook from college where they talked about stratification, that idea or that term comes from when they used to layer seeds in the ground or in a box with sand, and the strata or the layers or what gave it the, the technique it's named. And it's really um, when we wanna give these seeds a cold period, just leave them alone in this kind of dark, cold, slightly moist condition, and they're gonna mature, and then they're gonna be ready to grow. So how do you do that in modern days? Well, here's somebody built a nice box. Uh, this is outside on a patio or a porch, it looks like to me. They've planted the seeds in little containers. They've labeled each one. The box has a nice uh, screen on it. It's varmint proof, I hope, and they're stratifying. So they would leave that there for maybe three, four, five, six months, and then those seeds might be ready to germinate. Uh, we can also use our refrigerator if we put our seeds in sphagnum moss, sand, or vermiculite in a sealed up bag, um, maybe three parts of media to one part seed. Again, very slightly damp, labeled, and usually uh, 60 to 90 days, but again, it varies. And then they can be brought out and potted up. Okay, other ways you can do that, this kind of alludes to the winter sowing idea. We pot up the seeds in whatever media we choose, we put them in an unheated garage or greenhouse, and we give them that dormant period or that stratification period outside, um, or we pot the seeds, sink the pots into the soil in an unused corner of the garden, and we add hardware cloth for rodent screening. So, Multiple ways you can do that. Back to our umbrella magnolia. Needs 1.5 to two months of stratification at 35 to 41 degrees. And I think it was Dr. Durr reported about 80% germination after that. Uh, here's just a picture I stole off the internet of somebody growing Japanese black pine for bonsai. And they stratified the seeds on the left, which are germinating really wonderfully there. And on the right, they didn't. So we're just uh, emphasizing that stratification, if it's needed, is very uh, much gonna increase the percentage of germination. Now, scarification, I wanna definitely talk about that uh, for a second, because this is where uh, seed coats may have a very tough, or seeds might have a very tough seed coat, and we're gonna break it physically, even just slightly, to allow that seed to take up water and initiate germination. And literally, we're scarring it or scarifying it so that we can allow the water to penetrate the seed and the seed is gonna break dormancy. So in nature, how many ways might seeds be scarified? And if we were in person here, I would say, you know, I would ask you guys that and think about how seeds might be in the ground and broken down by microbes. They might um, run along the surface of the ground and be scar scarred by the gravel of the soil, or maybe animals might eat the seeds and their digestive processes would, would break down that seed coat. So lots of different ways. And that brings up our Kentucky coffee tree again. During the Pleistocene, mastodons ate the seed pods of Kentucky coffee trees. Their stomachs broke down the hard seed coats and the new trees would germinate in the piles of mastodon droppings. I absolutely love that story. Um, it's just so cool that that's what scientists think happened. And it's also interesting because Kentucky coffee tree is becoming very rare, even in its native areas of the United States, because we don't have any mastodons anymore. And the seeds take a long time to break down otherwise, and the tree is not propagating itself very well in nature. And I'm sure development and uh, changing climate don't help it at all either, but Kentucky coffee tree needs its system and it doesn't really have it anymore. So. How can we scarify artificially? Uh, we can use a file, we can use a knife, we can 
nick those seeds. We can use some sandpaper. We can use a nail clipper. I haven't tried that one, but there's the Dremel. Now, if you have a Dremel, here's another use for it. I have a couple of these Dremels. It's a little multi-tool. You plug it in, has a little selection of different tips you can put on it to do all sorts of household projects. And here is my Dremel and my Kentucky coffee tree seeds. And what I do here is I put on a little sandpaper bit and I take each of those seeds, which is about mm, the size of a nickel maybe, smaller than a quarter, but about the size of a nickel maybe. So they're easy to grab. You can just buff each of those seeds a little bit, just break that seed coat down and it really helps these guys germinate. Uh, these are just pictures of how commercial people do it with big drums and hoppers and things that will abrade seeds. Uh, there's also methods with hot water. You can pour boiling water on seeds that may break down the seed coat to some degree, depending on the species, and uh, enhance germination. And here's one that I would say, don't dry this at home. Uh, I don't want anybody getting hurt. Seeds of honey locusts are very tough and must be scarified. And what we did when I was in graduate school, propagating trees, we soaked it, soaked these seeds in sulfuric acid for 15 minutes. And then we washed the acid off the seeds, dried them, planted them, and boy, did these things really germinate. They would have never germinated otherwise. So we used acid to break down the seed coat. Don't do that at home. <laughs> it's dangerous. Probably nowadays we wouldn't be doing that in graduate school either, but it was the 80s and it was a crazy time. So, so we did that. And they really grew very well if you were interested in honey locust trees. Uh, you might want to uh, prime your seeds, and that's something we didn't talk too much about either. Priming seeds is where we soak the seed in water, uh, maybe for a period of a few hours, and that will convince the seed to take up water if it can, and if it's ready, and then that will enhance our germination as well. So I'll just show this planting very briefly because uh, you guys all know how to plant stuff, but um, there's a couple maybe little tricks with woody plants. We, again, with anything we plant in pots, we want the pot to be big enough to sustain a seedling for a little while, but not too big. So choose, um, you know, a pot that's maybe a couple inches tall, a couple inches wide. Um, for a slow growing species like that Japanese pine, they just planted those very tiny species or those tiny seeds in a flat and then they um, transplanted them out. So you can do that as well. But some trees really resent being transplanted when they're small. So you've got to look into that. Uh, things again, like the horse chestnut, they develop a taproot very quickly and you want to be aware of that. Um, so here's somebody growing some trees in a, a bigger container. They really need to be transplanted. Um, so think about um, what size you want to use for a thing like a Kentucky coffee tree, a fairly good sized pot is going to be needed because it's going to germinate and really grow rapidly when it's very small. And of course, make sure you have drainage holes and um, you got to think about how long you want to keep these in a container for. I do like these uh, very deep, relatively small containers for trees. Uh, this is an often uh, the way that these are transplanted up in a commercial setting. Uh, for when they're reforesting areas, they would use these tree containers um, on a large scale. And you might think about reproducing something like that, depending on how many you want to grow. And of course, we're very aware of hygiene these days. And this is not a COVID picture, but this is just saying if we have brand new containers, they should be clean. If we want to pasteurize or sterilize or whatever you want to say, clean up our old containers, we might use a mixture of one gallon of water with 1.75 cups of bleach and about five minutes that should clean up our old containers. Again, media selection, uh, lots of different mixes here. Um, I think some of uh, our discussion here today was how, you know, garden soil isn't always the easiest thing to propagate seeds in. Um, some of the store-bought mixes are also kind of too peaty or too heavy for propagation. Maybe you have a, a favorite mix that you've used in the past. Um, in the literature, they'll talk about making your own media, perhaps of two parts peat or core, which is from the coconut processing industry, to one part perlite or grit. You want a fairly light mixture, something that's going to have good water retention, but good drainage as well, and um, enough air in the soil uh, for good gas exchange. 
for seeds, I tend to like this uh, Fafford super fine germinating mix. I know I'm not supposed to do any commercials here, but there's other brands out there. And these are good for general seeds. Uh, not always necessarily necessary for tree seeds. For very small tree seeds, they might work uh, fine. Uh, for larger tree seeds like that Kentucky coffee tree, I just pot it up in uh, some mix of maybe some pine bark and peat moss. Okay, uh, we'll skip this media pasteurization. You guys probably all know about that. You can pasteurize soil in your oven if your spouse isn't home because it stinks up the house. Um, sometimes we cover seeds with grit. Um, occasionally, if we're going to wait a while for the seed to germinate, it tends to uh, reduce the chance of having some pathogens in there. Labels, of course, are very important. And we've talked about how it is important to label any kind of seeds you plant. And then just your system of germinating, you might try to do some of these under row lights. Uh, you don't really need to use incandescent lights, which are very inefficient and produce uh, unwanted heat, perhaps. The standard is the cool white fluorescent or maybe the LED lights nowadays. This light in this picture, which is in my basement, I would have to lower down once the seed started to germinate in order to reduce the stretching that seedlings will do. Um, and if you have covers on them, I'm not a really huge fan of keeping them covered in any way, but you want to make sure that you don't keep it too wet because too much moisture often inhibits seed germination. And I do have this flat on my bottom heat mat, which is a good thing for a lot of different types of seeds. Okay, so there's our germ, uh, Japanese black pine germinating. It, here it is after a couple years, and you're going to have wonderful woody plant seeds, seedlings. So um, back to our Kentucky coffee tree to wrap up here. Uh, those, that's a picture of the seed pod. Um, if you know where these trees are, and I can share uh, a couple, some seeds with some of you perhaps. Um, usually what I would do at this point in this talk is I would give out to everybody like a gift, a couple of these seeds from the Kentucky coffee tree. Now, I went to my source tree in November and all the pods were still up in the tree. They hadn't fallen down yet, so I couldn't collect them. And I haven't been back to the source tree yet. But if anybody is dying to propagate a Kentucky coffee tree, send me an email and I will at some point go back to the source tree and try to collect some seeds and see if I can get them out to you guys. Because they are a lot of fun and it's an easy tree to grow. Um, not very, uh, fairly high rate of success with these. I've done a couple classes where we, we do hand out the seeds and I've had a couple people get back to me and say, hey, I actually could grow a tree from that seed which is kind of cool. So uh, that's a picture of the seed of the Kentucky coffee tree and the wonderful bean-like structure. Now, of course, if, if you are interested in lawns, now nobody here is interested in lawns, imagine those falling all over your lawn and you're going to run them over with your lawnmower. Now somebody's going to say, aren't they messy? Yes, trees can be messy. <laughs> but I still like them even though I'm a lawn person. So that's what I have in my presentation there. I'm going to stop sharing and check the chat here. And let's see what we have. Okay. Do you have any advice for starting pawpaw seeds? Uh, that's a really good one. Pawpaw is a very interesting tree. Um, it's one I would have to look up. I've never done it myself. So we would have to look it up in the Durr book or the Dino book, or, or I would probably go to that uh, woody plant seed book first because it's the easiest to use. I imagine pawpaw probably is going to need a cold treatment. I don't know about scarification. I've never tried to grow pawpaw. I've tried to transplant it. I never had luck doing that. Um, so I don't know. We'd have to look that one up. Okay. They like the mastodon story, which I think is really pretty funny. How do honey locust seeds grow in nature? Well, they would fall down on the ground and I don't know that many wild animals would be attracted to a honey locust seed pod. I would think that they have to sit there for quite a few seasons probably to have that seed coat broken down in nature. So I would think that 
soil, microbes, the acidity in the soil, rain would slowly break those seeds down and eventually they would have the chance to germinate. And that's partly a, that's really a, a survival mechanism for the tree that seeds don't all grow quickly. It has seeds that might grow years from now. Okay, I'm curious about mother nature substitutes for the sulfuric acid for the honey locust. Yeah, I think it's natural processes out there um, that would be working on these things. And a lot of seeds are very, some seeds are very short-lived and some seeds are very long-lived. And uh, some seeds can live for decades out there waiting to germinate. And probably those honey locust seeds are in that category. Uh, what am I looking for to grow a red bud? Never noticed any seeds. Well, red bud trees will make small pea-like pods. Um, shortly after flowering, you'll start to see these little pea pods developing. And red bud is in the uh, legume family, so it kind of makes sense. And those pods will be green for a while and then they just dry and you can easily open them and you'll get a couple seeds in each one of those pods. Okay, so everybody liked our presentation today and pawpaws need moist soil. So I don't know, maybe they don't have a dor dormancy period. Okay, so I'm kind of done.